One, two, three. Hello, 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 and welcome to Storybook Day 2023, our first ever conference. Uh, we are just thrilled to be here, and we're excited that you decided to join us on this day where we celebrate all that's new and exciting in Storybook 7 and all the cool stuff that's happening in our community. The big thing that we want to share with you today is Storybook 7. Storybook 7 is a massive release that includes more than two years of feedback and iteration. Everything has been reconsidered and reworked. This makes right now the perfect time to rediscover Storybook and learn what it can do to improve UI development, documentation, and even testing on your teams. Today, we will start with Storybook 7, taking a first look at some of the cool new features available there today. We'll then look at the ecosystem as a whole and discover efforts that are being made to bring Storybook to more communities, more developers, and more frameworks. And finally, we'll close with some incredible talks by amazing engineers at some of your favorite companies. It's going to be an incredible day, so don't miss any of it. Before we start, I'm going to take one minute and do a little bit of housekeeping. This event is being premiered on YouTube. However, you may be seeing a view where we have a ton of chat that's happening in real time. If you want to get involved in that, join us in Discord at discord.gg storybook. The chat will be moderated and governed by our code of conduct in the Storybook repository. If you have any questions, feel free to at a moderator and we will make sure that everything is taken care of. This event will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel as soon as the event is over. And over the coming weeks, we'll upload individual videos for your convenience. If you'd like to stay up to date on those, feel free to subscribe and you'll get all of those as they come out. So what does Storybook Day mean for you and your day today? Well, we believe that stories are transforming the way that engineers create UIs. It's the one place that you can develop, document, and now even test your component code. Storybook 7 is all about bringing the capabilities of stories to new places, new frameworks, new communities, and new developers and designers. Please join me in inviting Dominic Nguyen to the stage, co-founder at Chromatic. He's here to tell us about the evolution of Storybook, where it came from, and how it's helping teams like yours improve the UX of the internet today. Hi everyone, I'm Dominic, the co-founder of Chromatic, the company behind Storybook. Over the years, Storybook has grown into an industry standard. It's the secret weapon that smart teams use to develop, document, and test UIs. But how did we get here? In order to understand Storybook's vision of the future, let's take a look at key moments from our past. 
When I first started web development, I couldn't imagine the scale of modern websites. This site was the absolute best we could do back then, and if you can believe it, the sites I made were considerably more amateur. So you can probably imagine my jaw dropping when Facebook passed 1 billion users. All of those users needed a unique profile page. That means some front end somewhere in the basement of Menlo Park had to support 1 billion pages, at least. We used to build front ends one page at a time. It started with HTML, CSS, and a sprinkle of JavaScript. You'd spin up the full stack, the front end, the back end, and services if you were fancy. Then you'd click around in the app to go to a specific page in just the right state. You'd double check that everything worked in other browsers with a bunch of preferences and system settings applied. Once you were done, you'd repeat that process over and over again for all the other variations that you had to build. As the years went on though, the number of variations grew exponentially. So fast forward till now, and frontends are a multiverse of UI state. There are tens of thousands of variations that you're responsible for developing. And that's if your frontend is small. The way we learn frontend development isn't suited for the scope of today's apps. I was first attracted to frontend development because there's a certain satisfaction in knowing real people actually touch your work. Like literally, they touch the buttons. That satisfaction has become kind of tougher to come by because front ends just got heavier. All of a sudden, it was too slow to spin up the full stack. It was too clunky to click around and fill out forms manually. And it was just too cumbersome to fiddle with all the little UI bits to get to the UI in the right state. That's when Storybook came along. Storybook started as a tool for developing components in isolation. The superpower of components is that you don't need to spin up the full app stack just to see how they render. You can render a specific variation in isolation by passing in props, mocking data, or simulating events. Since modern UIs are component driven, everything from button to page is actually a component under the hood. Storybook's key innovation was detaching components from your app so you could work on all of their variations and then save them as stories. Over time, it became clear that production UIs, well, they also need documentation. <laughs> Nothing's worse than coming back to old code and trying to load it into your brain all while juggling a deadline. That's why Storybook expanded to support rich documentation in Markdown and MDX. You could finally see how a component looked and learn how it worked side by side. This was also around the time when design systems were exploding in popularity. And with these UI documentation features, Storybook was in the right place at the right time to become the industry standard for developing those design systems. By now, more and more teams were adopting Storybook. And a big part of that was using stories and docs to share key states with other stakeholders. That sped up internal review with developers, designers, and PMs because everyone could finally reference the same UI. No more, it looks okay on my machine. We decided to take teamwork one step further as well. By embedding stories in other workflows, we realized that teams could reference the, that production UI when designing or product planning upstream of development, which ended up leading to fewer questions like, what's that UI look like again? We then realized the missing link between development and documentation was testing. <laughs> well, that's right. If you're gonna build a UI without testing it, it's going to break. In 7.0, we're building atop the best tools in the industry to launch browser-based component testing. Jan's gonna talk more about that later. We're here today to celebrate the new superpowers you'll get in Storybook 7. It's our 
biggest release in two years. And we believe that Storybook improves the UX of the internet. If you've paid bills, booked a hotel, ordered takeout, read the news, or submitted a form to a government office, I guarantee you, you've used something that was built with Storybook. What's more, there's never been a better time to be a part of this community. 17,000 developers list Storybook on their resumes right now. And if you're one of them, know that your skills are portable to thousands of other companies that have standardized their front-end workflow on Storybook. In the next few hours, you'll learn what's new in the project and the ecosystem. Chan, take it away. Thanks so much, Dom. It's awesome to see how Storybook evolved over the years and the impact that it's having on developers and designers in their careers today. Now, with all that's happening inside of our industry, we wanna make sure that you are empowered with the new tools that Storybook 7 provides, and there are tons of them. The Storybook team have prepared talks to make sure that you know all of the changes to design, docs, framework integrations, and out-of-the-box improvements. Here to give us that initial look at Storybook 7 is Michael Shulman, product lead at Storybook. Take it away, Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Shulman and I'm Storybook's product lead. I'm really excited to introduce you to some foundational changes in Storybook 7. These are changes that affect every Storybook user, whether your focus is on developing components, documenting, or testing them. I'll start with our design refresh of Storybook's UI and continue with some big changes to how we write stories. To motivate these changes, let's look at how Storybook usage has evolved over the past few years. In the early days, Storybook was a niche tool for UI perfectionists. And storybooks were simple. They captured use cases for a small number of atomic components. Fast forward to today, and storybook is a mainstream fixture of the front end tool chain. Now there are over 150,000 public GitHub projects that use storybook, and we estimate more than double that number of active storybooks. As storybook has matured, so is its usage. Today's storybooks capture complex production design systems and entire apps with data mocking and interaction tests. Large storybooks today contain thousands of stories. So you can see where this is going. On one hand, we've got hundreds of thousands of storybooks. And on the other hand, we've got hundreds or even thousands of stories per storybook. We haven't counted how many stories are out there, but it's in the millions and it's growing exponentially. That means everything we can do to improve ergonomics goes a really long way. So today I'm gonna to talk about three ways we're improving ergonomics in Storybook 7. I'll start with our design refresh, which cleans up a lot of things in Storybook's UI. Then I'll introduce component story format version three, which is a better way to write stories. And finally, I'll talk about better TypeScript support, which makes it faster and easier to write those stories correctly. The first thing you'll notice about Storybook 7 is that the UI has gotten a nice facelift. Our design refresh contains a lot of details that add up to a cleaner, better user experience. The biggest change is that we are able to really clean up the toolbar at the top of the screen. Storybook 6 contained a Canvas tab and a Docs tab. This information architecture was confusing to users and it occupied the most valuable screen real estate in Storybook. So we got rid of it. We'll talk more about the new behavior when we talk about Storybook 7 Docs later. The next area of, clean, of a design update is the icon set. We redrew more than 200 icons to increase visual acuity and then optimize them to reduce weight. The new icons are sharper and load much faster than before. We also changed our tab bar's responsive behavior to eliminate horizontal scrolling on narrow screens. Improvements like this go a long way to making Storybook more usable, especially on mobile devices. Storybook contains a wide variety of menus in its UI, and we've really cleaned house here in 7.0. Storybook's menus are tighter, more consistent, and more informative than ever before. And last but not least, we have dark mode. Storybook 7 automatically detects your system settings, 
and the entire UI adapts accordingly. Now I'm going to talk about a better way to write stories. Component Story Format version 3, or CSF3 for short, was introduced in Storybook 6.4 and has undergone a year and a half of refinement with the community. Now in 7.0, we're making it the default. The biggest change is that CSF3 gets rid of a lot of boilerplate, so your story files are shorter and simpler. We've also added support for scripted interactions and assertions so you can test your stories. And to make upgrading easy, we've got code mods to automatically migrate your stories to the new format. But if you're not ready for that yet, Storybook 7 is fully backwards compatible. So how is CSF3 different? On the left, we see a simple story file from Storybook 6.5. And on the right, we see its CSF3 equivalent. We'll go into some details in a second, but the TLDR is that less code means that CSF3 is easier to write and maintain. Let's start with a really basic hello button example. The default export is called meta, and it specifies the component we're building in isolation. And each named export is called a story, and it specifies the inputs that create a meaningful state of that component. Each file contains one or more stories. Each story object can have a render function that can fully specify and customize how your component is instantiated. In CSF2, every story was effectively its own render function. But 90% of the time, writing a story is just passing some inputs to your component in a standard way. So in CSF3, if you don't specify the render function, each story renders the component and passes in all the arguments. This really simplifies your code. Object spread is another great feature of CSF3. When you're trying to model complex states, it's useful to be able to reuse and extend existing stories instead of writing them from scratch. Object spread is familiar to all JavaScript developers, and now that stories are objects, it comes for free in CSF3. Another big change is CSF3's play function. This allows you to execute scripted interactions after the component is rendered. It allows you to reach new component states that aren't possible to get to just by passing props. For example, it's great for simulating form validation states. It also enables a bunch of new testing features that we'll talk about later. The last thing CSF3 streamlines is sidebar navigation. Storybook 7 figures out the title of your components based on the file location and displays them in the sidebar to reflect the directory structure of your project. You can also customize the title to structure your storybook the way you want it. Putting this all together, your story files are going to get a lot shorter and we're going to be eliminating millions of lines of boilerplate. After a few iterations of CSF, we feel like we're really getting it right. CSF3 is a solid foundation for both Storybook and the ecosystem of tools that produce and consume component examples. The last foundational improvement I want to talk about is TypeScript in Storybook 7. Fun fact, over 85% of pre-release Storybooks use TypeScript. That's why we're doubling down on TypeScript to make it easier to write stories with type safety and auto-completion. As a user, you want a few basic things from TypeScript. First and foremost, you want TypeScript to be able to check that you're providing everything that your component needs to render properly. You also want auto-completion so that you don't need to look at your component documentation every five seconds. That's exactly what TypeScript gives you, so that sounds pretty easy, right? Well, it's not as easy as it looks. Storybook provides a lot of flexibility for writing stories. Types can come from your component, from your story's render functions, and from various metadata like arg types. And component inputs can be spread across your stories, your meta, and your project annotations. To address these problems, we've improved the meta type for the default export. We've also introduced the story object type for CSF3 object stories. These are smart types that provide type safety and auto-completion. But that was a really simple example. Now let's look at something more complex. In this example, we have args split across both the story and the meta. If both the label and primary args are required, how do we let TypeScript know about this cascading? The first change 
is that instead of declaring the default export as of type meta, we say that it satisfies meta. Satisfies is a new TypeScript 4.9 feature that provides more type information with the variable. Then, when we declare our story type, we parameterize it not by our component, but by the meta object. This, along with the smarts inside meta and story obj, give TypeScript everything it needs to check properly. That was a quick introduction to our new CSF3 TypeScript types. In addition, Storybook introduces types for Storybook's config files, main.ts and preview.ts, and will be continuing to improve Storybook support for TypeScript in the 7.x releases with proper typing and documentation for story parameters from essential add-ons. We think we're on the way to providing the best possible de developer experience for TypeScript developers. Hello, welcome to Storybook Day. My name is Ian from the Storybook core team, and I'm here to talk to you today about some performance improvements that we've made in 7.0. The Storybook project began seven years ago, when the front-end ecosystem looked drastically different than it does today. It's been growing and evolving to meet the needs of today's developers, but it also does its best to continue supporting older paradigms and tooling. This naturally adds some extra heft to the code base that it likely wouldn't have if it were a brand new project today. Not only has Storybook been around a while, it's also used quite a lot. It just recently broke 5 million NPM downloads per week, and with 77,000 GitHub stars, it's ranked number 57 highest of all time. One of the reasons it's so popular is Storybook is a general tool for working with components. It's not tied to any specific framework. And now, with the addition of pluggable builders and Vite as a first-class citizen in Storybook 7.0, it does not depend solely on Webpack either. And for all of those different kinds of projects, Storybook has features like automatic docs generation, custom docs with MDX, a component testing system, and an add-on ecosystem that adds even more features. It takes a lot of code to do all of these things and to maintain such wide support. And over time, the technology we use under the hood naturally stagnates, is deprecated, or it gets replaced, leading some to say that Storybook is slow and bloated. And in some ways, they were right. So in 7.0, we set out to change this, and I think you'll be impressed with the results. For this release, we focused on a few ways we could improve the developer experience of Storybook by slimming things down. A smaller installation means you're up and running faster and your CI can get going quicker, giving you a more rapid feedback loop. We want Storybook to open up right away so you can jump right into developing, documenting, and testing your components. And if you're just getting started with Storybook, we want that process of getting it set up to be simple and straightforward. We've made big strides in each of these areas in 7.0, so let's dig in a little deeper and see what changes have been made and what effects they've had. Node modules can take a long time to download, especially for users who don't have the fastest internet. We wanted to be mindful of that, and so we spent time cleaning up our dependencies and ensuring that only what is really necessary is included. Let's compare how a new installation of Storebook 7.0 in some common types of projects compares in size against the same projects with the previous version of Storybook 6.5. First up is a Create React App project, which uses Webpack version 5. But Storybook 6.5 defaulted to installing Webpack 4. So unless you explicitly set up Storybook with the optional Webpack 5 packages, you'd end up with lots of extra node modules. Now, Storybook 7 ships Webpack 5 out of the box, which dramatically cuts the number of total dependencies that it needs to install into the project and reduces the resulting size of node modules by a fifth. Okay, but what about in a Vite-based project? Well, in a React V app, we also see a drastic reduction in the total number of dependencies, and an even higher drop in the file size, cutting out nearly a third of the weight. But you might be thinking, sure, but those are both React projects, and you said Storybook supports all kinds of projects. Well, all right, let's take a look at another common type of project, View 3, using Vite. Here too, the number of dependencies is cut in half compared to Storybook 6.5, and again we have a more than 20% smaller node modules footprint. 
That's a lot of time saved waiting around for NPM to install. But what if you're not using NPM? What if you care a lot about the performance of your package manager and you're not satisfied with either Yarn or NPM? What if you're using something else? Something like PNPM. It stands for Performant NPM, and it works a bit differently than other package managers. Now, I won't go into the details here, but Storybook didn't always have the best support for PNPM, especially in Vite projects. I made it a personal mission to improve our PNPM support, partly because I want to use it myself, and the whole team worked hard to make the whole thing seamless. In 7.0, Storybook will automatically use PNPM to install your dependencies if it detects a PNPM lock file, and is supported without resorting to workarounds like hoisting or installing lots of internal Storybook dependencies. Using PNPM can improve your installation times in some scenarios, and it's becoming increasingly popular. So it's worth checking out if you're not already using it. So what are some of the ways that we were able to achieve such an impressive reduction in node modules? Well, much of it was due to upgrading old and outdated dependencies. Previously, we shipped Webpack version 4 as a default, with 5 as an option. But now we've dropped support for Webpack 4, improving compatibility with modern Node.js versions, and removing many deprecated and unmaintained packages. Speaking of Webpack, up until now, the sidebar and panels of Storybook were built with Webpack, but that changed in 7.0, and now Webpack isn't included at all if you're using V. Similarly, we've upgraded MDX from version 1 to 2, improving support for React 18 and cleaning out even more old dependencies. Tom will talk a little bit more about the MDX upgrade a little later. Storybook's last major release was two and a half years ago, and a lot has changed since then. Supporting Internet Explorer is finally no longer a requirement for most developers, and modern versions of Node.js have excellent support for new JavaScript features. So by only supporting modern browsers and Node 16 and above, we're able to avoid shipping so many polyfills, which were increasing the size of our distributed code and dependencies. Another great benefit of updating and cleaning out our dependencies is that NPM Audit now reports zero potential vulnerabilities, so you can rest easy. The reason we can stop shipping Webpack for Vite projects is because of the work that Norbert and others did to change the way that the Storybook Manager is built. Now, the Manager is the Storybook UI itself. It's everything except for the preview, which is where your components are rendered. Previously, Webpack ran every time you started up Storybook to bundle the Manager and any add-ons you had configured. And we did some smart things like caching the results when we could, but the cold start time still took a while and it meant that even Vite projects had to have Webpack installed in order for Storybook to work. But now that's all been re-architected, and instead of Storybook building itself every time you start it up, it's pre-bundled before release, and that has a few benefits. The manager now has a much faster cold start time, somewhere between half a second and three seconds, depending on how many add-ons and stories you have, whereas before, that could take up to half a minute in some cases. Another benefit is that the dependencies used in the manager don't run the risk of conflicting with the ones you have installed in your app. For instance, Emotion is used for styling, and previously having multiple different versions of Emotion being installed could cause problems for some users. That's no longer a problem now with pre-bundling. And we've taken this one step further and started to pre-bundle some of the Storybook runtime that is used in the preview iframe, which saves even more time during startup. One key way of achieving faster startups is to do less work. There were a lot of improvements in version 6 of Storybook to make sure that stories could be lazy loaded, uh, which means only sending the files to the browser that are needed to show any given story. You could opt into this behavior in version 6, but it's the default now, making it even easier to have a great experience. And if you're using Webpack, you can take it one step further with lazy compilation, so that Webpack doesn't even process files that aren't needed in order to show the current story. The success of tools like Vite and Parcel have taught us the importance of developer tooling that just works. Previously, it could be a little difficult to set up Storybook with frameworks like Create React App or SvelteKit or Next. And that config has been greatly simplified, and Storybook has a new framework API, 
which Kyle will go into more detail on later today. Another recent change in the ecosystem has been the move from CommonJS to ES modules. In Storybook 6.5, we expected to write your config files in CommonJS, and TypeScript config files only worked in some cases. Now in 7.0, Storybook allows and even encourages you to write your config files in ESM or TypeScript. Storybook has supported V since version 6.4, but up till now, users had to recreate their whole Vite config just for Storybook. Now, Storybook will read your Vite config file automatically while still giving you a chance to override config if needed. Similarly, your Svelte config file will be read and used automatically now. Finally, for those of you upgrading from 6.5, we've created a number of code mods that will automatically update your code to match the new 7.0 conventions. Michael Shulman will talk about that in more detail a little later on. So we've been hitting the gym and we've made some big improvements to slim down Storybook 7.0. To make sure we keep that weight off, we're running benchmarks for install size, bundle size, startup time, and more on every run of our CI. By tracking those metrics, we'll be able to detect changes that hurt our performance, and we'll have increased focus on further improvements going forward. We'll continue to make Storybook fast and lean while supporting the growing front-end ecosystem and pushing forward with features and capabilities found nowhere else, some of which you'll be hearing more about coming up next right here on Storybook Day. Hi, my name is Tom Coleman, and I'm a co-founder of Chromatic and a core maintainer of Storybook. Uh, in my Storybook development, I focus mainly on the rendering stack of Storybook, so the part of Storybook that renders your stories and, crucially, also renders your docs. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, today, I want to talk about a revamp of Storybook docs that we've done as part of Storybook 7. You know, we released Storybook docs a couple of major versions ago, and we've taken a lot of feedback over the years about how it works. And we wanted to take the opportunity to rethink a few things and really tighten things up and make it better for everyone. So to start with, let's just talk about what Storybook Docs is. You know, as you're using Storybook, you're writing a bunch of stories, which are component examples, that, um, ways of showing or of telling the computer how the component is used. And that is a great development tool because it allows you to quickly uh, get your component into a given state and work on it and improve it and uh, make it better. But all those examples that you've built, all those stories that you've built are also great if someone wants to use your component, if you want to share it, if you want to make it reusable. Uh, how do they use your component? Well, you've already got a big list of ways to do that. Um, and so why not make those component examples available and viewable by the consumers of your component? And so Storybook Docs is a feature that uh, you know, makes it possible to build long form pages that include all your stories inside them. Uh, we, we either automatically do that for you or we offer a bunch of features to allow you to customize it. Uh, and we'll get into that as we talk about what's changed in Storybook 7. So the most obvious change in Storybook 7 is the movement of docs from being sort of a story level feature to being a component level feature. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look on the left hand side, you'll see that the um, docs um, tab is up in the toolbar. It's right next to canvas. When you've selected a story, you can then switch into docs mode. That kind of gives the idea that docs is a story level feature. It's sort of another view of a story. But what we realized is that you're not documenting your stories. That's not the point. You're documenting your components. So we've moved the docs tab down to be underneath the component in the, in the sidebar and enable uh, you to think of docs as a component level feature. It's I'm documenting this component and the stories are just how I'm doing that. Um, this makes, also makes it a lot easier for use, new users to find it when they're viewing your storybook. You know, they had to, previously had to know that the docs tab was up there. It's not as in your face. Now, when, as soon as you browse to the component, the first thing you'll see is the docs entry. And it's, it's very clear that it's sort of uh, a top level feature of a component. It also makes it more consistent when doing things like putting in unattached docs like introduction that document the whole storybook or the whole component library rather than a uh, single component and makes it possible to put more than one doc for the same component. Uh, the key, a key feature of Storybook docs is auto doc. So we've talked about that already, automatically using information in your storybook, particularly your stories, but also metadata that we can extract from your uh, set of components 
uh, from your source code uh, to show information uh, to build a docs page without any intervention by you. Um, one change we wanted to make was to make that a more deliberate choice. So not so previously you had to either have every component documented or none. Now you opt into it. So you choose which components make sense to be ordered to be docu auto documented. So in this case, you know. The docs, the button component is a reusable component. So it makes sense to tag it with auto docs and to have it show up in the sidebar with a docs entry. The page component isn't really reusable. So we don't really need to document it in that same way. So we don't give it the tag and it doesn't show up with a docs entry in the sidebar. Um, a big focus of the Storybook 7 effort for docs was to make it easier and more intuitive to customize your documentation. So we've seen like the kind of out of the box default, but what happens when you want to tweak it, you want to add more information, you want to make it a little bit nicer. Uh, the first way you can do that is to customize auto docs and there are a set of parameters that you use to do that. Uh, auto docs is ultimately built from a set of blocks, which we'll discuss in a moment. And those blocks can be controlled either directly, and um, we'll also get to that in a moment, or sort of indirectly via parameters that you put on the story. So in this case, we're seeing this primary story is showing up in the story list. Uh, it's good, but it, it could be it could be a little bit better. So why don't we give it a description? And we do that via JS doc. Um, we can document both the story and the component using JS doc. And this is great because it means that your code and your documentation stay in sync without any effort from you. Um, but also we might want to make the source code available straight away. So we can add the canvas source state parameter and, and that will make that open by default. Um, we might also want to change it to show the raw source code rather than the JSX that we were looking at a moment ago. That's the source type uh, parameter. And so there are a whole set of parameters um, that control these various blocks. And um, we've put a lot of work in to make it a lot more consistent and um, intuitive what those parameters are. So that's auto docs. But the second thing you might want to do is completely control the way the documentation for a given component is written. And the way we offer to do that is using MDX. MDX is marked down with components. It's sort of an industry standard format. And Storybook includes a lot of improvement. Seven includes a lot of improvements to the DX of writing MDX in Storybook. Um, so here's for an example of a what, what I referred to before as an unattached docs page, it's sort of a documentation page for the whole uh, storybook or the whole design system. Use the meta tag with the title to do that. I'll talk about that in a moment. And you can see within here that the MDX shows up inside your storybook straight away, and it's it's all it's all very simple. Um, storybook seven has a lot of improvements to the MDX. The biggest and most obvious one is the change to MDX two, which is the latest release of MDX. MDX two is great. It has a lot of good features, uh, a lot of improvements, some of which you can see here. Um, it's also a big change. Uh, we do include some code migrations to help, but um, if you need to, you can opt out of MDX2 and continue to use MDX1 for the uh, 7.x uh, release cycle. Um, a big focus of Docs2 was to make customizing Docs easier and more intuitive, as, as I've said. And I'll take you through a few of the doc blocks. These are things that you can use inside your MDX files to get Storybook's function automatic functionality. Um, that, that appears in Autodoc, um, a big focus has been to make it more easier to use and also more consistent. So let's start with the meta, the meta tag, the meta um, block. Uh, the meta block controls where your um, doc uh, page appears in the sidebar. So you can see if you use a title, as we saw before, it shows up unattached, sort of not attached to any particular component. And you, you don't actually even need to have that if you just like to use auto, um, auto titling to just put it based on the file name. Um, if you want to attach a, a meta file or an, a docs file to a component, use the meta of. And this of syntax you'll see everywhere in the doc blocks. It's our new way of attaching things to other things, uh, doc blocks to components or stories. We use of and, the Im and we import the exports of the story file, the CSF file. Uh, there's a few reasons for that, but the primary one is sort of tooling related. Um, it means that, you know, your editor can tell you if you've got it wrong, essentially. And so you can see here, if we do meta of button stories, our docs file appears under button. Um, we can also add a name, and this is the way you add a second one um, to, uh, to create a second docs file for the same component. 
Another block that's had a lot of changes in 7.0 is a description block. We kind of mentioned it earlier. It uses uh, your JS doc that's embedded in your source code uh, to produce descriptions that you can embed in your MDX file. So here you can see like the pure usage of a single description block um, produces a line of text. Where did that text come from? It came from this JS docs of the component. You can also, uh, of the story, you can also use it for a component and then it'll pull the JS doc from the component. Um, the canvas block is a really important one. You, we've seen it a bunch of times already. It's the one that renders a story alongside its source code, a little toolbar potentially. So here you can see a canvas block has been customized in quite a few ways that um, are similar to what we saw earlier. So you can see here, the canvas block has a bunch of props that are very similar to the, not very similar, that match up identically with the parameters that we saw earlier for a story to control the way that the canvas was rendered. The controls block is a really important block. It's another one that appears in the auto doc. This is the um, block that lets you see the args or the inputs to a uh, story or a component. And in particular, it lets you change them. So when you do controls of a story, we're doing here for the primary story, you can see that we've got all the values of the args that that story uses. And if you change them, toggle them, uh, update them, the story, assuming it's also rendered in the MDX file, will update accordingly, which allows for really great interactive experiences in your docs page. Uh, so that's a really brief and quick tour of some of the doc blocks that we've changed in 7.0 or improved. Uh, there are a bunch more. Uh, please check out our docs um, to, to see the, <laughs> our documentation, to see the full uh, list of doc blocks that you can use. And you can even use uh, a special uh, helper called use of to build your own, that same of syntax. Um, additionally, um, you know, this is a big change. A lot of these blocks have changed. Um, everything that was working in 6.x is still supported in 7.0, but there are a bunch of deprecated things that you'll hopefully migrate away from uh, either now or um, in the next few releases of Storybook. And to help you do that, we've built some auto migrations, which are really powerful and will save you a lot of time. Um, so here's an example of um, probably the biggest one of them all. So. Um, one big change that we made um, is we've deprecated the ability to write stories inside MDX files. Um, we got feedback that it was confusing. When should you use CSF? When should you use MDX to define stories? Uh, our new position is always CSF and then import them into MDX, um, which is what we've been seeing in this talk. And so here's an example of a old style stories.mdx file that's written and is defining a story called primary. And so what we can do is we can pass that to the MDX to CSF or migration code mod, and it will automatically change it into an MDX and a CSF file. Button stories.js, the CSF file, which defines the same story, button.mdx, the new documentation file, which shows it. And that will happen for as many MDX stories.mdx files as you have. Um, and should, you know, in the case of Storybooks that have done a lot of that make your life a lot easier and get you up to the latest and greatest weight of your using Storybook and Storybook docs in 7.0. So thanks a lot for that whirlwind tour of Storybook 7's docs. Um, we hope that you find it like a lot easier to use and more intuitive and that you are able to document even more of your components and share them around and get people reusing them because that's one of the main goals of Storybook is to make it easier to reuse your components and make your UI better. Um, thanks very much. Um, cheers. Thank you so much, Michael, Ian, and Tom for sharing with us all of the new capabilities wrapped up into Storybook 7. Now, I'm excited about the performance stuff, but I cannot wait to get my hands on the new docs. Before I started working at Chromatic, I was maintaining a Storybook that was MDX all the way through and through. This was before I knew the incredible power of CSF or component story format. So it's really cool to see a new docs that takes advantage of the best of MDX and the best of CSF. Speaking of the power of CSF, stories have become a great place for you to author tests. I know, wild, who would have thought? Well, to talk more about that, I'd like to invite Jan Braga to the stage. He'll show us how to write our tests directly inside of Storybook 7.
Hi there, my name is Jan Braga and I'm from the Storybook team. And I'm here to talk about component testing. So when it comes to developing components, a typical workflow for an application developer is the following. Let's say you're developing a sidebar component, but in order to actually test it, you need to navigate throughout all your app pages. And then you need to interact in this restaurant detail page, add some elements to the cart so that you can see the sidebar in a failed state. So as you're making more changes in the future, you want to be able to know whether your component still behaves correctly, which means that you need to do that manual step over and over again, which is a rather tedious job. So that's why we write tests. We want to automate those steps so that we can cache regressions automatically and get confidence so we can work on our, on our app. So when it comes to testing components, how do you actually do it? Well, let's take a simple use case here. We have a page that contains a button that once clicked opens a model. The anatomy of a component test needs three steps. You need to be able to isolate a component and set up a test case for it. You need to be able to simulate user interactions like clicking on a button. And you can use tools like testing library for that. And lastly, you need to run assertions so that if you click on a button, you have to know whether a model appears on screen or not. And you can use tools like Jest or VTest for that. But the thing is, it takes quite a lot of work to set up those isolated test cases. So on the right side, we have an example using React Testing Library in Jest, where in order to actually just render the component in isolation, I needed to set up a routing mark. I needed to pass a theme provider. And I also needed to set up some state management mock just for the component to render. So then I can finally worry about making some interactions and making some assertions. But because all of these things are running in Node with JS DOM, I don't have a visual feedback as I'm setting these up. So if everything is simple and easy to set up, great. But if it's a little complex and you get some errors, yeah, best of luck. How do you translate all of that blob of HTML into something visual? So what if UI tests gave you a visual feedback directly in the browser? That's pretty much the motivation why we created Storybook Interaction Tests. So Storybook Interaction Tests would allow you to write tests in your stories and get to run them directly in the browser. But before I even get to that, let's just take a step back. If you're using Storybook, let me tell you that you are already writing test cases. So Stories pretty much define a test case for a component. And you can be writing particular stories for, let's say, a restaurant card, where you're testing the loading state of your component. You're testing a closed and a new state, which is already a great way to make sure that your component behaves as expected. But also, you might be using, let's say, Storybook to test theme variants. So your components can be looking good on dark mode and light mode, and you're able to actually check those side by side and see whether your component is actually taking into account those theme tokens. And maybe you're also using add-on controls, for instance, so you can get into specific edge cases, like what if I have multiple categories? Or what if my component doesn't have any category at all? Did I just catch a bug? Or did I just notice that there's a missing story? So you can also get into something more complex in Storybook. You can, you're able to render pretty much anything you want, and that goes for more complex features or even pages. But as you get to that level, you're probably going to have to mock server requests. And you can use Mock Service Worker to actually proxy those requests and mock the way you want. And as a, an example, I have an entire page rendered in isolation that is fully functional but I can also leverage the mocking from Mock Service Worker to get into a loading state, which is really hard to reach, or a 404 or a error 500 state. So going back to interaction tests, pretty much you were already able to test a lot of stuff in your storybook, but we want to augment that experience even more. So interaction tests is pretty much where your stories are test cases but you can also now simulate user behavior in the browser by using the tools that you already use and love, like tests, testing library and Jest. So for instance, in our button scenario, we actually get to open the model automatically in the browser. So how does that actually work? Well, let's take a look. 
If you're writing stories, you might be already familiar with args and decorators and other properties. So we now provide a play function, which is a new annotation to the story that essentially executes after the component renders. So in this example, because my story is already set up, I only worry about the interactions and assertions. So in this play function, it contains the test code that would have been in a test file otherwise, but it's just writing um, directly in Storybook. And in order to make this possible, as you can see, I'm using fire event and expect to be able to click on a button and expect the model to be there. I'm using browser compatible wrappers that provide are provided by Storybook for testing library and Jest. So then my Storybook provides this very interesting automated experience. But to make things even more interesting, we provided an add-on called Interactions. The add-on Interactions essentially provides a visual panel for your, your code, which is shown in the panel. And you can step through the interactions by using the debugger. And that makes it more easy for you to understand what's going on without having to go all the way back to the code all the time. So let's take a look at it as an example. I have an entire app actually as a story in Storybook where each story represents a flow from the home page down to specific story. So over here, you can see that for each and every page, I have interactions which are executing previous interactions and more interactions so I can get all the way to the success page. And in the add-on panel, I can click on the debugger to go all the way to the first interaction and step through them to see exactly what is actually going on. I can also click on a specific one to jump directly to it, or I can go all the way to the end. If there's any failure in between, you will see them visually in the browser. So going back once again to the code, you actually noticed that I was using different interactions that got previous interactions from other stories. So actually, the play function can be reused, which makes that your makes your tests much more maintainable and easy to extend. And they're also shown in the panel. But also the step function, which which we also provide, gives you a nice way to wrap a set of interactions to have a more readable label. And finally, you also get to see the actual code from your interaction in the panel. And the interesting fact is that the play function runs any JavaScript code you want to put there. So you can actually augment your experience by customizing the way you want. In this example, I actually used the play function in an augmented way to provide a more visual feedback of my interactions so that I can show this to stakeholders and they get to experience exactly what the flow is in a more visual way. And you can pretty much implement anything you want like that. So in order to make things even more interesting, the testing ecosystem of Storybook also provides a test runner. So you can get this nice local experience in Storybook, uh, but you get to automate those tests by using a Storybook test runner, which is powered by Jest and Play, right? And you can get to use all of the interesting features that they provide. So the Storybook test runner gets each and every one of your stories and turns them into tests. So if they do not have an interaction test, they are tested for rendering issues. And if they do have an interaction test, they execute the interaction and you get the result from it. And the very interesting experience is that the Storybook test runner runs in headless mode, but once there are any failures, you actually not only get the error in the, your CLI, but a link that once clicked opens your storybook directly with the add-on panel shown with the failure. And that helps you get a lot of confidence and debug your stuff directly in the browser, which is really cool. So just like any other test runner, the storybook test runner also provides code coverage reports. So you can pretty much get to know exact, exactly which parts of your app are getting tested and which ones are not. So you can leverage that to generate HTML reports that actually provide you a visual way. Oh, look at that. The loading state of my button is actually not covered, which probably means that you need to write a new story. So code coverage also works seamlessly with any tools that you might be using in your workflows like CodeCov and Sorna Q. And that's pretty much why 
uh, we think Storybook is the foundation for testing UI. There are a lot of very interesting functionality there, and we're putting tons of effort uh, in the upcoming releases. So talking about automated tests, if you're actually using Chromatic, you might be wondering, hmm, will I also get the support for interaction tests? Well, the answer is yes. Chromatic is always up to date with any Storybook version, which means that it's already supporting Storybook 7 and its features. So, so, so Chromatic is going to run visual regression tests, as you already know, uh, but also now in par with um, interaction tests. So if there is any failure, as you can see here in the dashboard, it will be caught by Chromatic. On the right side, you see that we have different types. So now there's a new type called interaction. And in this case, my restaurant detail page with the model open failed my test. The thing is that Chromatic provides the visual state of the component before uh, it failed with the interaction, but also the whole feedback directly in Chromatic. So not only you get to see the error of message, but you also get to see the composition of environments like the branch and the browser and the viewports, which happened, uh, the error happened. You also get to click on a link that goes directly to your deployed storybook with the failure open as well. But the difference here is that Chromatic deploys every commit of your, uh, every commit you make, Chromatic makes a deployment for your storybook, which means that you have a reproducible URL that you can share with anyone from your team. So Chromatic also has integrations for CI, which means that if you are writing um, interaction tests and they fail, or maybe you have some visual regression, they will also be shown in your workflows. And you can optionally uh, set up like a block so that people can only merge a pull request once everything goes green. And that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. And I hope you enjoyed this so far. Um, you can reach out to the tutorials we have on the website. There's an entire book on UI testing, which has nine different chapters on all kinds of testing you can do for UI. And um, yeah, I hope you liked this so far. Thank you so much and happy testing. Thank you so much, Jan, for showing us how to bring world-class interaction testing right into Storybook. Storybook is honestly becoming an incredible GUI for UI tests. Now, the JavaScript ecosystem moves really, really fast. And because Storybook sits at the center of integrations and frameworks and libraries, it can be pretty chaotic to try to keep up to date with all of these library changes. We asked ourselves what we could do to improve the availability of Storybook to the broad JavaScript ecosystem as a whole. And for us, that means improving the stability of our framework integrations that already exist, but also making changes to the architecture so that new integrations can be made with ease. To talk more about these efforts, let's bring Kyle Gatch, a DX engineer at Chromatic, to the stage. Take it away, Kyle. Hey there, I'm Kyle Gatch, and I'm a developer experience engineer at Chromatic. My focus is helping people learn Storybook and making it as easy as possible to get started and be productive. So let's talk about Storybook and compatibility with the tools that you use. Since version five, Storybook has been focused on working with the broad ecosystem of front-end development tools. Things like React, Vue, Angular, Web Components, Svelte, Webpack, Vite, SAS, CSS modules, styled components, Emotion, Post CSS, Tailwind, and many, many more. It's a critical part of what makes Storybook work for you. It's got to work with all of the other tools that you're using. Our goal has always been that Storybook works with all of your tools with minimal setup. Prior to Storybook 7, we tackled this problem by publishing packages for builders and renderers, and further configuration was provided by presets and add-ons. This worked, but it still required some setup between each of those packages, particularly if you're using a meta framework like Next.js or SvelteKit, which provide a bunch of configuration for your project that Storybook needs to mimic. Before we move on to explain the new architecture, I wanna zoom in on the renderers for a second. The code snippets on our doc site are specific to the renderer that you've chosen. So the React docs show React code, the Vue docs show Vue code, and so on. How often have you been looking through our docs and encountered a message like this? 
You'll see that message whenever you encounter a code snippet that isn't written for the renderer that you use. Web components in this case. We did an audit of every code snippet in our docs and found that they were only available for about 70% of the cases. So the real state of our snippets was more like this. As I said, we want Storybook to work with all of your tools and that includes how we document things. So the Storybook 7 documentation has full 100% coverage for code snippets in each of our four core renderers. That same snippet now looks like that. Okay, back to the bigger picture. In Storybook 7, we still have builders, renderers, and the other configuration, but now we package up those tools into easier to use combinations that we call frameworks. They contain a builder like Webpack or Feet, a renderer, React, Vue, Angular, Web Components, Svelte, and so on, and any necessary configuration to build and render your components and stories. For example, the Next.js framework pictured here combines Webpack, React, and a few styling solutions and a bunch of next specific configuration into a single package. We'll look at this one in more detail in just a bit. Another more bare bones example might combine V, Vue, and some Tailwind configuration. These new framework packages enable a zero configuration setup for most storybooks. So far we have frameworks available for combinations of all of these popular tools, but we're just getting started. In addition to the frameworks themselves, we also released a framework API. That API was used to create all of the frameworks that you just saw. It makes it straightforward to leverage existing builders and renderers, or you can integrate a brand new one. And the API is available to the community, so you can create a framework to extend Storybook to work with your tools and share it with others. Let's dive into a couple of those frameworks we're particularly excited about. One of the first frameworks we built to help develop the API was for Next.js. It combines Webpack, React, and most of the built-in features of Next.js, which will just work out of the box in Storybook now. Next.js 12 and 13 are both supported, and all the features you see here are included. So for example, it works with both the pages directory and the experimental apps directory. It also works with the old and new versions of Next Image, Next link, next navigation, next router, next font. We've done a lot of work to make sure that next projects work really well in Storybook. And in the future, we're working directly with Vercel toward building support for the brand new TurboPack builder, as well as a better experience around React server components. I want to give a big shout out here to Ryan Clements and Aaron Reisman, who have community add-ons that provided a great start to this work. We've also developed a Svelte kit framework. It supports the brand new Svelte Kit 1.0, so you can develop and test your component the Svelte Kit way right inside Storybook. For example, your asset paths and web imports will both just work with no effort on your part, and you can access a mock of your app store as you're developing. We're working closely with the Svelte Kit maintainers to add even more features, notably support for mocking form and navigation actions, which is coming up next. We're also discussing how Storybook might be able to eventually support some of the more server-side features. Are you ready to try it? Frameworks are built right into Storybook 7's CLI tool. So upgrading your project or starting a brand new one are each a single command away. Now note that Storybook 7 is still in pre-release, so you'll need to use that version of the command, but we expect to have the official major release very soon. Let's see what it looks like to start a brand new Next.js Storybook project. It, first, it'll detect the type of the project for you. It'll install all the necessary dependencies. I sped that part up a little bit here. It adds the necessary Storybook configuration, as well as some example stories to get you started. Finally, it'll run a few optional auto migrations, which are just helpers to translate from one version to the next, such as adding a Storybook linting plugin and then helping you migrate from MDX 1 to 2. The Framework API provides our best foundation yet for supporting the huge variety of tools that you use to make your projects. Here's a sneak peek at what's coming up next. So we're, first, we're continuing to work on the Next.js and Svelte Kit frameworks, adding more features and improving their stability. And we're also working with community members to develop frameworks for Solid.js, Nuxt, Quick, and Remix. We're so excited about the potential that this Framework API um, brings to supporting even more of the ecosystem. Thanks for coming along. We're super excited about the Framework API and the frameworks that we and you can build with it. 
Next up, Michael Schillman will talk about the steps we've taken to ensure these frameworks continue to work as both the tools and storybook release new versions of features. Thanks. The JavaScript ecosystem is rapidly changing. This makes it hard to keep your app or design system up to date. It's also a serious challenge for tooling. We struggle a lot with this in Storybook in the last few releases, so in Storybook 7, we're bringing out the big guns. To motivate this, let's look at how the ecosystem has changed over the past few years. For example, consider Webpack. You may remember Webpack 4 and 5 major version bumps. You may even have some PTSD from those. But it's not just Webpack. There's also Vite that recently arrived on the scenes and has already had three major version bumps. And it's not just builders. Package managers have also been rapidly changing and dependency semantics along with them. You might have transitioned from JavaScript to TypeScript, and TypeScript has been evolving over the past few years as well. And renderers like React, Angular have all evolved. And even meta frameworks like Next.js are also progressing rapidly. And this is just scratching the surface of all the changes in the ecosystem. To address this, we're starting to treat Storybook like a service, and we want to maximize the uptime in this chaotic environment. To do this, we're testing a bunch of frameworks on every PR and daily. These tests are summarized at storybook.js.org status. If you notice something in Storybook that seems broken, you can check this page to see how it's doing in our CI. Drilling into any heartbeat in the page, shows the detailed status of that run. It doubles as a compatibility table, so you can see which features that particular flavor of Storybook supports. Behind the scenes, we have a whole process set up to keep it green. So far, we've fought, caught and fixed four major ecosystem bugs and breaking releases. In each case, we fix Storybook within a day or so of the event. We think this is a great system for keeping up with the ecosystem, and using this, we expect Storybook to be more stable than ever before. Another source of instability is intentional changes to Storybook. Every time you upgrade, there are a bunch of tedious steps. We've created a new system called Auto Migrations, which are smart code mods that upgrade your project. These migrations are tailored to your specific project configuration. They detect whether they're needed, and if so, will prompt you and inform you about the relevant changes. If you opt in, they'll upgrade your project automatically. Here's an example of an auto migration to migrate from .stories.mdx to .mdx in Storybook 7. We run the command, it prompts us for the change. When we accept the change, it updates our main.js config accordingly. Magic. We take migration really seriously. We're upgrading a bunch of Storybook projects to make sure they upgrade smoothly. These projects like GitHub Primer, Material UI, Svelte UI components, and so on, span every renderer that we support and thousands of stories and complex configurations. That's a quick introduction to a few ways we're working to improve Storybook stability. We hope that despite the massive scope of Storybook 7, this is going to be the smoothest release yet. Thanks so much, Kyle and Michael, for showing us the efforts that Storybook has been making to improve availability and stability within the JS ecosystem. OK, so this is the end of part one of our day. And we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to kind of stand up, take a break, get a glass of water, do what you need to do uh, without feeling like you are missing anything. So that time is about to start. Now, we take community feedback extremely seriously, and we want to give you an opportunity to voice your thoughts and opinions. Now, you might not be a part of the day-to-day -day storybook community, and that is totally fine, but we want to make sure that we hear from you. So whether or not you have concerns, frustrations, or just new ideas, we hope that you will take a few minutes, just five minutes to complete this survey and really help direct the future of Storybook. That survey is available at storybook.js.org slash survey or on screen now with a convenient QR code for you. Okay, so that's it for part one. We're gonna put 15 minutes on the clock and we will see you back very soon. Three, two, one. Get ready.
Hello, 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 and welcome back to Storybook Day 2023. We hope that you are refreshed, re-energized, and ready to learn some new amazing things. Right before the break, we learned what the Storybook core team is doing to improve availability and stability with the JavaScript ecosystem. That's great for the ecosystem as a whole, but what do some of these changes mean for you and your apps directly? To answer that, let's bring Sean Evening to the stage, DX engineer at Chromatic. He's here to take all of these ecosystem changes and bring them home to your storybook. Take it away, Sean. Hey friends, my name's Sean Evening and I am a developer experience engineer at Chromatic. And for the last few months, my focus has been on storybook integrations, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So let's start off by talking about the state of the storybook ecosystem. Specifically, let's talk about how you can integrate storybook into your favorite tools and how you can integrate your favorite tools into storybook. I've got some examples here of tools that integrate directly into Storybook. The first category being design tools. In Figma, you can link interactive stories right into your designs. So you can play around with them as if they were right in Storybook. And on the other hand, we've got Zeppelin that lets you link designs to stories in Storybook while Anima turns your entire storybook into a native Figma library automatically. But that's it for the design tools section. How about some documentation tools for the design system enthusiasts around? We've got tools like Zero Height, Supernova, and Fredify, all of which let you embed stories right into your documentation for your design system. Pretty cool. But let's look at some code side of things now. We've got some frameworks here that make use of Storybook. NX lets you manage your Storybook across the entire NX project, while Redwood JS automatically generates Storybook files with each component that you generate. So you get to start writing stories right out of the gate. But that's not all. These are some tools that work with Storybook here, but we also have an entire library we're calling the integration catalog on our website, which is pretty cool. It's home to over 500 community add-ons that add more features or integrations with tools to Storybook. And it has combined 44 and a half million weekly downloads on NPM, which is pretty wild <laughs> watching it grow. And there are add-ons for a ton of different things. Let me give you some examples. Maybe you want to link your designs, like we already talked about with Zeppelin. Or you could just share your design tokens. You could mock API requests. Maybe if you're feeling like it, you could link Jira tickets to your stories. Maybe you want to scan your stories for accessibility. Uh, infractions. Uh, maybe you want to force pseudo states on some of your elements, or maybe you just want to edit your theme. You can do all of those things with add-ons in the community. Now, if we think about our add-ons as code solutions, towards the end of the year, we made a new kind of integration that we started sharing in the catalog. Recipes. You can think of those as your step-by-step -step tutorials. Let's take a look at an example here. Here is the integration recipe for emotion and bring that into Storybook. This particular recipe goes over how you can set up your global styles, use emotion components, and how to add and switch between themes in Storybook so you can see what your stories look like in light and dark mode, or maybe even your custom themes. But that's not all. Similar to emotion, we have recipes for styled components, Beautify, Material UI, Tailwind CSS. But if you're wanting to perhaps support multiple languages for your stories, we also have a recipe for how to set that up with INT Next. So why did we do it? Why recipes? What's in it for you? Well, 
They're searchable in the Storybook docs. So if you type in the name of that package you want to get set up in Storybook, if we have a recipe for it, it's going to show up right in the list of search results for our documentation. On top of that, we also have example repos that you can dig through to find out how it was all set up if you want. And on top of all of that, we have dedicated maintenance from our team. So that should always be up to date for you. No more looking back at old blog posts from us or someone else in the community on how to set up your favorite tools that might most likely be out of date. But the most exciting thing about recipes, for me at least, is the fact that recipes have the opportunity to evolve over time. Let me give you an example. Back in 2021, our friend Michael Chan, also known as Chantastic, wrote a blog post for the storybook, and that was how to set up Next in Storybook. It was a really, really long article with a lot of steps, but it was awesome. A lot of people loved it. In fact, they loved it so much that a few folks in the community uh, went and made an add-on out of it, so then it could be done automatically for everyone. And the crowd went wild. Not only that, we loved it so much that it inspired us to make it a fully supported framework out of Next.js for 7.0. You heard my friend Kyle talk about that a little bit earlier. How about another example, something a little bit more new? After writing a bunch of those UI library recipes over the last little while, I distilled all of those learnings into this new add-on, add-on styling, which gives you out-of-the-box support for styling and themes for a ton of tools with little to no configuration, depending on what tool you're using. Let's have a quick look at an example here. This is an example storybook that uses Tailwind. And you can see throughout the different stories, we're able to flip between light mode and dark mode that's built into Tailwind. But it doesn't just work with Tailwind. It works with all of those recipes that I mentioned earlier, and a few more. Also, we have documented setups for Bootstrap and Post CSS as well. But it's generic enough of a library that it can work with most, if not all, styling libraries and tools. So check it out. It's available now. Download it. So now we've talked a little bit about the ecosystem, ways that you can integrate Storybook into your tools, ways to integrate your tools into Storybook. And I think it's fair to say that Storybook has become a cornerstone of UI development. We have an ecosystem of hundreds of integrations made by a ton of amazing people in the community that help you tailor Storybook to you and your team's needs. And our goal moving forward is to continue to nurture and support that growing ecosystem. In fact, I wanna hand things over to Katarina from Narwhal. And they're gonna talk a little bit about all of the amazing work their team has been doing to bring Storybook into NX. Take it away, Katarina. Hi, everyone. I'll just let. So, Today, we're going to talk about Storybook 7 in monorepos with NX. I'm Katarina Scrumpelu. I'm a senior engineer at NX. I'm a GDE for Angular, Google Maps, Web Technologies. I'm a woman tech maker's ambassador, a speaker, instructor, and a cat person. And you can follow me at CyberCity or Cyber.City. So what we're talking about today is what is NX and why use NX with Storybook how Annex supports Storybook development and how it helps you set up your monorepo to use Storybook and how you can migrate your Annex workspace to Storybook 7 right now. What is Annex and why use Annex with Storybook? Annex is a next generation build system with first class monorepo support and powerful integrations, which means it's fast. You never rebuild the same code twice, and X can figure out whether the same computation has run before and can restore the files and the terminal output from its cache. We also offer distributed cache execution, smart, automated, dynamic distribution of tasks, 
across multiple machines to get maximum parallelization and CPU CI runs. We also offer remote caching. You can share your local computation cache with teammates and your CI system, and you only run what changed. NX analyzes your project graph and can diff it against the baseline to determine which projects changed and what tasks need to be rerun. Also, it's configurable. We have a whole plugin ecosystem. We offer powerful integrations with multiple modern tools like Storybook, for example. We also offer a dev kit for custom tool building. You can customize NX to support different technologies and custom use cases, for example, with it. And also NX adapts to your workspace. You can choose your style and make it work for what you already have. We also offer great DX. We have a powerful CLI, the NX CLI. We have integrations with IDEs like VS Code, IntelliJ, and NeoVeeam. We also offer an xCloud GitHub integration, and you can run all your tasks through an X. What that means is that we have generators which help you architect your workspace and generate code for you. We have executors to build, test, lint, and automate tasks which call other tools. We also have migrators which helps you upgrade easily with just one command, NX migrates. Now let's see how NX supports Storybook development and helps you set up your monorepo to use Storybook. Uh, we offer code generation, builder integration, code migrations, NXDT and cache, documentation and community support. Let's see code generation first. You can add the Narwhal Storybook package to your workspace with just one command, yarn add minus d at Narwhal Storybook. And you can call the generator nxg at Narwhal Storybook configuration project name, or for example, if you have a React project, call the React specific Storybook configuration generator. What this generator will do for you is it will install the right dependencies it will configure Storybook for you. It will sort of generate the .storybook directory. It will generate stories for you. And it will also generate Cypress E3 tests for you. So say you want to configure Storybook for my React app called my React VT app, using the VT builder, configure Cypress for it, generate Cypress specs, and generate stories as well. To do this, we would run the following command. nxg at narwhal react storybook configuration name of your React app, configure Cypress, generate stories, generate Cypress test bundler vite. What this would do is the following. Uh, it would install these dependencies for you if you're generating for Storybook 7, for example, add on essentials, React and React vite, and it would generate the following things. The dot storybook directory with main.js, preview.js, ds config, uh, .stories.tsx file, so stories for all your components. You only have one component here, so one story, and your E3 tests. Uh, your storybook.main.js would look like this. You would have React Vite, and uh, because you're in a monorepo setting, you have to specify the path to your Vite config files. Just so you would have to add the full path to your Vite config file like this. NX will do this for you automatically. It will generate this for you. And say that you have a component that looks like this. You have the app props, so you have the name, the age, and sort of a Boolean that looks like this. NX will generate the following story for you for this component. Uh, you see we're using CSF3, and it would add all these props as arguments, the name, the age, and the active with the correct type as well, with the correct starting value. CSF3 syntax. Then we would also, NX would also generate the Cypress specs. So you can see that it would generate a Cypress test that would visit the iframe of your storybook. So Cypress would start a, the server, it will launch storybook, and it will visit the slash iframe with the correct props. So if you had a secondary story with the arguments of name Katarina, age 34, active, true, and let's remember the template. If you added the Cypress to visit the iframe, you would pass as arguments in the URL name Katarina H34 active true, and you would write the test to test that in H2, for example, it renders the name correctly, or in H3, it renders the age correctly. Now, when we say builder integration, 
we mean that you can use an X Storybook My React VTAP or an X Build Storybook, and you can call the Storybook Builders through an X like this because we have our own executors where we call the builders. You can also have the code migrations uh, by running this command, nx migrate at narwhal storybook at latest, which will run a number of scripts to upgrade storybook to the latest version as an X sees it. <coughs> also, when we say that we offer uh, an XDT and cache with storybook, what we mean for storybook through an X is what we mean that because you run your commands through an X, it means that all your builds and your tests and whatever you do with storybook are getting added into the NX ecosystem directly and into the NX cache. So you take advantage of this. Uh, as we said, we also offer documentation and community support. So we offer extensive documentation of how to use and set up Storybook in your NX workspace. We tell you how, what the best practices are for setting up Storybook in your monorepo or in your NX workspace. And we also have a whole community where you can ask questions. We have Slack. We are pretty active also on the Storybook Discord, answering questions. We collaborate closely with the Storybook team. So you're definitely supported in all your steps on using Storybook with an X in your monorepo or, or not monorepo. Now let's see how you can migrate your NX workspace to Storybook 7 right now. <coughs> For the past couple of months, we have been working closely with the Storybook team in perfecting the migrator scripts. So in an X, we have this generator called that Storybook slash at normal slash storybook migrate uh, seven, which this generator, what it will do is it will prepare your files for migration. It will call the SB upgrade. So it will call the storybook CLI upgrade script. Then it will call the storybook CLI auto migrate script, which now works with monorepos and then X. And then it will make some final adjustments to your files and then you will be ready to go. So now let's see how this works here. We have a NX workspace, which uses Storybook 6.5. And we want to see how you can use the migrate seven command to migrate it to Storybook seven. You can run your migrate command with dash dash only show list of commands. And you will see a list of commands that you can run on your own if you want to migrate, which is generally to call the storybook scripts. But you can also call just the storybook migrate um, generator. And let's see what that will do. It will tell you on each step what it is doing. First, it will call SB my SB upgrade, which will upgrade your storybook package versions to the latest version. And then what it will do, if you look closely at the logs, this is a combination of logs from the Storybook CLI and a combination of logs from the NX CLI. What it will do is it will run for each one of your projects, the Storybook auto migrate command. You can see which command is being called on each step because we log it out. And it's usually the SB auto migrate where we pass a config directory specifically for each of your application or, or your project. And specifically we tell it which renderer to use, which we get from an RNX configuration. After this uh, migration completes, we see that all the packages were upgraded to the latest versions. Then we can see the that it removed some configurations from an X, like the UI framework, which is no longer needed. And we can see the changes that it made to main JS, for example, for an X JS project, for an Angular project, or even for a React project using Vt and using a uh, TypeScript configuration for Storybook. So it made all these changes to all these main JS files. Uh, and we can see how this looks, but it also generated finally a file called 
storybookmigrationsummary.md, which shows you a summary of all the commands that were run during this migration. This is for you to know what happened during these steps, since it's a combination of commands run through an X and commands run through the storybook CLI. It is generally recommended that you run this migration with a clean Git history, so please commit your changes before and after you run the migration scripts. That was all. I hope you now know more things about NX and how to use it with Storybook. You can follow me at CyberCity or my website cyber.city and please follow NX at NXDevTools on Twitter or find us at NX.dev. Goodbye. Thanks, Katarina. A, a little trivia for you. Uh, Storybook actually uses NX to manage our monorepo. We love NX. There's an incredible team over there, and we love the work that they're doing. Okay, so up to this point, we've heard a lot about Storybook 7, and that's great. But if you're like me, you want to see behind the scenes, peek behind the curtain, and see what other engineers are doing to support their teams with Storybook. Well, you're in luck because our community stepped up big and we have amazing talks from engineers at BBC, Monday.com, Intuit, The Guardian, Working & Co, and T. Rowe Price. We are so excited to share their talks with you because they're doing amazing things at these companies. To kick this section off, I'd like to invite Lisa Chin to the stage. Customer success lead at Chromatic. Hi, I'm Lisa and I lead the customer success team at Chromatic. I'm excited to talk to you today about how teams use Storybook. As we saw in Dom's talk earlier this morning, we know that teams now build UIs using components. So everything from atomic components like buttons and sliders, all the way up to full page components. And they often end up with hundreds, if not thousands of components. That's a lot. Storybook helps you to manage this complexity. It helps you develop these components in isolation so that you can verify all of their use cases and even mock those hard to reach edge cases. Once components are isolated, you can use Storybook's built-in testing workflows like accessibility, interaction, and visual testing. You can also publish your Storybook to get feedback from other teammates so that developers, designers, and product managers can all align before shipping a particular feature. Storybook also offers a really nice documentation feature where it can take those stories that you've written to auto-generate documentation pages for each component, complete with live examples and even an API table. And once you publish your Storybook, you can actually embed stories into other tools like Notion, Confluence, and Figma. How these Storybook features are used will really depend on the particular context that a team is working in. One of those use cases is design systems. When you're building a design system, it's usually built separately from an application. So to build components, you need some kind of a sandbox environment where you can build, test, and document components. And Storybook provides you with just that environment. Teams are able to write stories for all of the different states of a component and all the different variations that a component supports. And then use the Storybook Docs add-on to auto-generate documentation pages for all of those components. And we've seen Storybook used for all kinds of design systems. It's used for building government design systems, so teams like Gov.UK, the United Nations World Food Program, and the European Union. We've also seen Storybook used to build design systems for companies. So companies like D2IQ, Audi, Microsoft Fluent, and Adobe Spectrum, amongst many, many more. All of the same challenges that come with building design systems also exist when teams are building open source component libraries. So it's not surprising that Storybook is used for a lot of these libraries, such as RiaViz, which is a charting library, Gromit, Chakra, and even Dry, which is a WebGL library. So even UIs that are WebGL based work well with Storybook. Storybook is also used to build entire websites. One of the challenges when you're building a website is that you're often supporting multiple browsers, multiple viewports, different color palettes, different themes, and the UI has to respond to all of these scenarios and often looks quite different in all of these various states. Storybook can capture all of these variations for different components as stories and allow website developers to test all of those variations. 
A couple of examples of that is the BBC and The Guardian. And we'll hear more about this from Natalia at the BBC and Oliver at The Guardian later today. They need to support different responsive behavior, theming, accessibility, and localization. That yields a lot of different variations. So teams write stories for all of these variations to test the full breadth of the UI. That way, when they make a change, they can see how much of an impact that change will have across their entire ecosystem. Storybook is also used for application development. One of the challenges with applications is that application components are higher up in the component tree. So they can fetch data, manage application state, and often pass data down to lower level atomic components. So not only do you have to test how the UI is rendered, but you also need to test the underlying functionality. Storybook's new interaction testing feature allows you to test component behavior along with how the component actually looks. A couple of examples of application teams that use Storybook are Shopify, which has over 649 million customers, VS Code, which has 14 million users, Mozilla, who uses Storybook to test a checkout workflow within their Firefox ecosystem, and Netlify, who uses Storybook to test the Netlify platform. Lastly, Storybook is also quite a popular tool for agencies. At an agency, you're often working on multiple client projects simultaneously or go from one project to the next. And you have to deal with sharing the UI that the team is creating with the stakeholders and the customers to get feedback. Storybook helps agencies streamline that workflow. They're able to publish the storybook and then share that with all the stakeholders to get feedback on the actual coded UI and not just the design specs. So as you can see, Storybook has a lot of different use cases. And coming up next, we have some folks from the Storybook community sharing some real world examples of how they use Storybook. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are right now. I'm Natalia Zmusowska, and I'm a senior software engineer working in the design system in BBC. Our topic today is about creating an easy way to find dependencies and dependents of the components in the library. Have you ever been in a situation where you wanted to change or enhance the component, but struggled to find its owner? It happened to me so many times, as our library consists of over 150 reusable components and containers. Some time ago, we conducted user research about improving the navigation in our storybook and internal onboarding UX designers process, during which we found out that many people struggled to find the owners and maintainers of specific components. It made it more difficult for them to collaborate with other teams. In our testing sessions, we heard a lot of people say, if you didn't know name or create the component yourself, it's almost impossible to find it. We quickly realized that the audition of discovering the component's owners in Storybook would benefit everyone who uses it, not just UX designers. All stakeholders would find it much easier to onboard new designers and developers from other teams giving users greater autonomy in finding what they need around the design system. Not only would navigation be easier, but also each team page would demonstrate the breadth of the components and containers that particular team uses. Our fantastic UX designer, George, came up with the idea of creating a page for each of our capability teams which would detail which components and containers that team uses. His idea was that users would be able to navigate to the component they needed to find, even if they didn't know its name. For example, if they knew it was being used in account team, that would narrow down their search while also not putting emphasis on knowing the name of the component. But you know what? As the plan was forming in our heads, we realized that unfortunately there is a problem with our approach. How do we maintain all the data we need to generate the team pages when it constantly changes? 
To build a team page, we would need a list of every component a team uses. And this was a challenge given the amount of code and dependencies we have in our repository. On the top of that, new components are added and used in new ways by different teams so that data would change regularly. This would be really difficult to maintain over time. We didn't want to manually create and maintain the data for the team pages. Work smart and not hard, as they say. We wanted automation. This problem led us to building on some custom functionality called It Depends. It Depends started as a hack project to enable Storybook users to know where a component is used and see examples of its use on the live site. It was designed to help users to understand the component's purpose and to decide whether they could reuse it. The feature depends on some in-house functionality to generate the data files which map all of the components, their usage, and their dependencies. These dependencies are auto-generated based on what a component imports and where that component is imported. Let's look at the more technical side of it. First, we decided to write a function that would create a list of components in Storybook. That list would be passed to another function in the it depends, which would check the import and export tree for all components in the repository by parsing the component's JavaScript file and generating a JSON object containing a list of each component with the corresponding components that it uses or is used by. Next, combining both outputs would generate a list containing all the teams and the components they use. We leveraged our detailed code owner's file to programmatically establish which team maintains and uses which component. The final output would be the big list containing the information about teams and the components they use. Unfortunately, it's not perfect yet. There are a couple of known limitations with the component dependencies functionality and the most important one of them is import depth. Because we parse the component's JavaScript files to determine usage, only a depth of one is currently supported. For example, only components which directly use or are used by the component are included in the list of dependencies. For example, on the media experience container, the media player component does not appear in the users list. It's because the hierarchy for that container is as follows. Media player component is used inside media item component, which means it's not directly exposed to the media experience container. That means a user needs to click through to the media item component using the link in the users section, where the media player will then appear in the users list. Once we overcame the difficulties, we created a page per team using the components from within our components library. To facilitate collaboration between teams, we decided to add a short description about the team and what department they are part of. To make it even easier to reach out and collaborate, we included a link to the dedicated help Slack channel of that team. It is saving us a lot of time in time-consuming Slack conversations, pointing people in certain directions, whereas now they know who owns what and have a Slack channel ready to open if they need information. As you can see, Storybook gives us a lot of flexibility. It allows us to solve the problem by implementing additional functionalities. It improved navigation between our own components and also demonstrated the breadth of the components and containers that each particular team uses. Thank you for your attention and a huge shout out to the whole WebCore team and the BBC that contributed to It Depends and Team Pages. Thank you.
Hi, and welcome to how Monday.com uses Storybook for UI development. I'm Or. I'm an engineering manager at Monday.com. I lead our design system, aka Vibe. Before I show you how we use Storybook, I want to give you some context about Monday.com or in the organization. We are about 300 people, including developers, designers, and product managers. We believe in being loosely coupled and highly aligned, which means that we all have the same goal, but different teams have different methods achieving these goals. We expect our team to have full ownership on their domain, and we support rapid growth environment, which means that everything is up for change. And I mean everything. We are around 200 developers, and most of us are full stack developers, which means that we do everything from the back end to the front end. And we don't have QA. We expect full ownership from, all the, from our developers to do the QA by themselves and own their content. We have 50 designers. That means that every team, almost every team, has their own designer, both motion and product designer. We are huge believers in atomic design. We try to structure our UI ecosystem in the same manner. From our core libraries, Vibe and Vibe Atmosphere, to our other layers of our micro frontend. So let's start with the core, our core libraries, Vibe, and Vibe Atmosphere. So what is Vibe? Vibe is our design system. It's where we develop our core component, such as our inputs and buttons, tabs, etc. This library is being used by all of our developers and external developers, such as Apps Builder or any other developer who wants to use our library. We are open source. You can see it in action in style.monday.com. And of course, you can check our GitHub. Atmosphere is our complex components library, such as our boards, our pricing pages, our, our person pickers, and everything within the system. This library is being developed by our entire R&D organization and then changing on a daily basis. We use Storybook as our main developer, development UI platform, but it is much, much, much more than that. It's our source of truth for both designers and developers. We've invested tons of time in it, building it with content which is relevant for both designers, such as do's and do not do's to our UI's infrastructure, UI core principles, and for developers, such as our props and code snippets on how to use each component. We use story shots to make sure that nothing changes other than what we really, really want to change. And of course, we're using interaction testing to test complex flows on re real browser. We interact with Chromatic to our CI CD pipeline. We use it to run all of our tests in a real browser on every branch, on every change. We work with comments to bring designers right into our dev lifecycle, getting feedback and design review from a very early stage, thus preventing bugs and getting the best product that we can deliver. And of course, we also use visual testing in Chromatic to monitor our CI CD and making sure that nothing really changes. Having all of these abilities that I just mentioned allows us to, to deliver quality core libraries with over 80 contributors from within and outside of Monday. So using Storybook and Chromatic in our core libraries is pretty straightforward. We use a lot of their ability to keep us safe and move quickly. But I really want to show you how we use Storybook and Chromatic in our monolith to, to keep regression from happening. So what is our mon monolith? So we've been around for about 10 to 12 years now, and we have a huge, huge monolith with technologies varied from Backbone and CoffeeScript to new modern React with TypeScript. The dev experience there can be really hard. And sometimes it takes tons of time to get, get yourself acquainted with what's in the monolith itself. So this is where Storybook comes to our aid. We use Storybook for three main things in the monolith. First, visual testing with, with TurboSnap. The second is creating complex states of our, of our stories with mock, with mock service workers. And the cherry on top is performance regression tool that we, we've created. We are running visual testing on Chromatic. We have around 400 open PRs at any given moment. Adding to that, what we call compound effect, which means that we use a lot of our building blocks all around the system. And each PR may change some of these building blocks. So monitor all of the, all of the core flows that use these blocks is pretty hard. Visual testing helps us identify breaking changes in our CI CD. Running complex component permutation with the overhead of feature flags and, and 
A-B tests make us feel safer when we deliver quality product. And on top of that, we use TurboSnap to identify the change files and run only the relevant stories and visual testing, cutting down the costs and make our CI CD much, much, much more quicker. We have our stories for our most complex pages, like our boards or dashboards. We leverage a mock service worker plugin within Storybook in order to simulate real world use case, basically running our entire monolith within Storybook. This unique ability with our unique state builder can provide amazing developer experience writing complex stories. And the best part is that, that our developer don't need to mock anything just to render to component. The cherry on top is that we use Storybook in order to monitor performance regressions, like frame per seconds. Testing performance requires a predictive and consistent environment, which Storybook is perfect for. I would love to show you how this custom plugin works. When the story initializes, we read the specific performance matrices that we want to measure. When the story runs, we measure them. When the story finishes, we collect everything, every data that, we, that we've measured, we analyze it, and send it to our internal tools. During the CI-CD, <clears throat> we compare the, the results into mas to master. And if the results vary by a specific amount, we fail the CI, which means that we've just prevented a performance hit on our product. So Monolith is our past, and we would like to tell you how we scale our frontend with micro frontend and storybook. Each micro frontend has its own storybook. We love micro frontend. It really goes with our full ownership approach, where every team can have one micro frontend or more. They can deliver their, their product on their own pace, and they can select whatever technologies they feel relevant to, pro to provide our user with the best experience. We've created our own internal solution for micro frontend called Trident. One of its pillars is zero config, which means that we have unified build for every micro frontend, a unified lint, testing configuration, and of course, unified storybook. We have more than 40 micro frontends writing their own personal storybook. And of course, we will maintain the same developer experience across all of our UI ecosystem. So what is Trident Storybook? When we create our micro frontend, we install all of our Trident packages, which contain custom preview JS and other, another shared storybook configuration. With Storybook's custom customizable nature, we allow different repos on different repos to run the same configuration, which is stored in, the, in our node modules, and basically provide a scalable storybook approach. Every storybook available for every micro frontend looks the same, behave the same, and we can push updates such as cool toolbars, cool accessibility tools, and of course, our own custom toolbars that we provide. All of this provide great user experience for micro frontend to the core, core, to the core libraries that we are using. To sum it all up, we are using Storybook in every UI layer in all of our organization, and Chromatic keeps us safe and helps us to ship quality and performant UI. Thank you, Storybook and Chromatic. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Webb, and I'm a staff software engineer at Intuit, working on QuickBooks within our Australian office. At Intuit, we serve more than 100 million customers around the globe, and our mission is to put more money in consumers and small businesses' pockets through our products like TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and MailChimp. We have a long history with Storybook, both with our in-house design systems and a number of open source contributions we publish for Storybook that you can find over on our GitHub. Today, however, I'm going to share a little bit about how my team has used Storybook to build complete application features in isolation from our backend systems and how that's enabled us to deliver features to customers much faster. What I've seen on past projects is front-end engineers can get really slowed down by two things. First, getting backend set up to reproduce data that will create certain states in the UI, and then driving the UIs in browser to reproduce the scenario they're working on in code. So here's a specific example. We maintain a feature that allows our customers to upgrade their existing QuickBooks subscription, subscription with our payroll feature. To make changes to this feature in our dev environment and really test it out fully, 
We need to create 57 different types of test companies to check subtle differences in the code between them. Then with each test company, we need to launch the UI, interact with it until it's in the state we need, until we can see the effects of our code changes. So because this particular feature activates an external API, that means running this setup work over and over again each time. So this is where Storybook comes in. As we all know, Storybook excels at capturing or freezing UI components in various states. But what if you wanted to capture your whole application in a specific state just to work on a specific part of the code, like our payroll feature that I just showed? So the approach we've taken is to bring a mock backend directly into Storybook to quickly reproduce these kinds of scenarios. There are two great options for this. Mirage.js and Mock Service Worker, which both provide mechanisms to intercept HTTP traffic, allowing you to code repeatable backend responses to your application. Here's a simplified example of how we define those backend responses in our stories. So this is a fairly straightforward story file. First thing to notice here is that the story is based on the root of our whole application. So we're rendering the full React code base here. In fact, every one of our story templates looks the same. We render the full application each time. Where things get interesting is via a custom decorator we've built that allows engineers to specify backend request handlers per story. Before I get to that, though, let me show you how engineers interact with it at a story level. So we leverage the story's parameters to allow these HTTP handlers to be declared per backend API, allowing us to code specific responses to any calls the application makes. In this example, I'm just returning static data, but I could easily provide a kind of mini server impl implementation here that responds to requests that would actually mutate data in the real backend and return those changes back through any subsequent data fetch requests. So with this setup running, the application will run within Storybook and any API requests will be intercepted by Mirage, match with our story request handlers and return to the application's fetch code transparently. So our code won't know it's not calling a real backend. Without going into too much detail on Mirage, you get console logging that shows you the intercepted requests and also logging where your code might be making requests you haven't handled yet. So you can spot those and code the missing mock handlers you need. So this frees up front end engineers to code up any kind of back end data scenario they need. All those time consuming setup cases I mentioned earlier are where this saves us a lot of time. Another great benefit here is the really hard to reproduce scenarios such as server errors. You can code stories just to see what your application does when your backend returns responses like unauthorized or server error HTTP codes, which is a lot quicker than tearing down your development environment to reproduce an error. This also insulates your front end teams against change in your development environments. So if you're trying to manage breaking API changes or other issues, engineers can code in isolation within Storybook. We've even used this to start work on a project with no backend, defining API contracts first, then having both back and front end teams build code simultaneously that can be integrated together later on in the project. Here's a simplified version of the Storybook decorator that we use for Mirage. So this is set up globally in Storybook. And as you can see, it looks for that Mirage handlers parameter on each story, then enumerates all the endpoints and handlers the story declares, registering those with Mirage to intercept HTTP requests and return the corresponding handler responses back. One of Storybook's most exciting features for me is interactions. If you're new to it, this lets you define a play method on your stories that you can use to drive your stories UI using the standard Jest and React testing library APIs. You can also define standard Jest assertions for how you expect your story UI to respond to both user input and backend responses. So combined with the mock backend setup, 
you have an environment where you can build, validate, and test very specific user scenarios within your application quickly. This brings a whole bunch of benefits to your software development lifecycle. First, you can use those interactions to kind of fast forward your UI to specific states. So if you're adding functionality at the end of a multi-step process, this can gut, cut down on all those repetitive UI interactions engineers have to make to see their code changes run. Second, by including interactions within your overall CI pipeline, you get co-coverage co over your investment in Storybook. This is really critical for me because as Storybooks start to grow, they face the same problems as the underlying application code pieces can without sufficient test coverage. Parts will break and you won't know about it. With, with interactions, you can protect both your stories and the underlying code simultaneously. Third, because interactions run directly in Storybook, this gives engineers the real user interface to debug. If tests aren't working as expected, you have all the browser tools at your disposal to inspect DOM state and figure out why an element can't be found, for example. So here's how all this looks pulled together. We start our application template to render the full application. Using our Mirage setup, we define story-specific backend responses to create certain states within the UI. Then finally, we can leverage Storybook interactions to define specific user behavior that, that drives the outcomes we expect from our applications. This setup with Storybook makes a huge difference to our build time. With Mirage, we can reproduce user scenarios and fix bugs quickly. Adding interactions on top, we gain co-coverage over both code and stories and provide an environment to engineers that can make tests easier to debug. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of Storybook Day. Hey everybody, today we're gonna to talk about how to conquer style bleeding with the CSS Chaos add-on. My name's Alex Wilson and I'm the lead engineer of the Beacon Design System at T. Rowe Price. So what is style bleeding? Well, style bleeding refers to the situation where you try to apply styles to one element, but they end up getting applied to other elements on the page in a way that's a bit unexpected. And this can happen when styling gets applied to the element selector itself, kind of like what we see in our button example at the top right. Um, that button styling will get applied to all buttons on the page, unless there's other classes that have a higher level of specificity. Second is when class selectors are just too generic. And we can see that in our second example, where we're using two .btn classes with different properties. Well, those properties are gonna clash with one another when actually applied to the element. And then finally, the use of inheritable styles can certainly introduce style bleeding issues. Inheritable styling is a feature of CSS, and we should use it when it makes sense to do so. But if we're trying to lock down the styles within our components, it may not be the best time to use them. So what's the overall impact? Well, first we have brand and consistency. We want to make sure that the components that we're building within our component library and we're seeing in Storybook look the same way there as they do within the application when the users are actually interacting with the site. And that's not always the case, especially when style bleeding is involved. Second is that we can introduce accessibility failures, uh, dealing with contrast, font sizing, and layout, among others, that could result in a poor experience for any user, but especially those that have short and long-term disabilities. And finally, we have the maintenance cost that's associated with it all. If we're working to fix those style issues, we have to sift through all the different style sheets and make sure we're only changing the styles that we need to change to fix the issue and not impact the rest of the site. So hasn't this already been solved, you might be wondering? Well, there are some workarounds that include using naming conventions such as BEM, block element modifier. This is a very common tactic to help avoid class property merging. You could also use browser APIs. I always suggest using what the web has to offer, and the Shadow DOM is a really promising technology that allows you to scope CSS to a specific element's implementation. It's been widely adopted by web component users, but it can also be used without web components. And finally, we can introduce JavaScript, such as the CSS and JS library, which applies generated class names to HTML elements. However, some of these libraries have shown to reduce performance so it would be worth weighing your options there, weighing the pros and cons. 
None of these methods, however, help reduce inheritable styling issues and impact properties like color, font size, weight, border sizing, and many more. And that's why we need to introduce the CSS Chaos add-on to do some of that testing for us. A little bit about the add-on, you can easily set inheritable styles through the add-on view where we have the property name, a description of the property, and a drop down of different values that you can use to apply around the component that you're building. And once you're applying those styles, you can actually see the issues that come up within an application before it hits the end user. Second, we have the ability to randomize those values. So if you don't wanna click through and manually change them, you can click the randomize button as many times as you want just to make sure that your component is hardened enough. And if you find one and miss one, you have the ability to go back and go through the history and find that configuration that caused all of those problems. Once you have that configuration, you can copy the applied styling out into your Jira ticket, your rally ticket, if you're looking to tackle it later, or if you're looking to tackle it now, you can copy it into your code editor. So let's see an example. All right, so here we have our masthead or our header. We've got our logo to the left, we've got the company text there, and we've got our login and sign up process starting to the right. All right, so this looks pretty good. So it's ready to ship, right? Well, let's take a moment and take a look at our application context. So if we were to pull it into an application, we can see here that there are some styles that are overriding our, our header. So we could go in and inspect this, but let's just go back to our component and see if we can find it out another way. Well, let's bring in the CSS Chaos Tester. And we know that we have a color problem. So while we do have all of these options here, let's just focus on color for the moment. It's currently using uh, the inherit property, but if we change it to red, then we can see the exact same issue we were seeing in the application. All right, so if we take a look at that and inspect, we can see that our header content doesn't actually define a color, which is our main issue. And we can see that the color is being applied here. It's not crossed off because nothing's overriding it. So that's what's bleeding into our header component. Okay, so let's go over to our VS Code editor. If we go in and change the color to the original color, which was black, and click Save, we can see that the color is coming through now as it should. We can also see that the class here now has that color property. If we scroll down, we can see that the color is crossed out, meaning that it's been overridden by something within our styles. If we go to the application page, we can see that the company title now uses the right color, and we've secured those styles. The component is now more hardened than it was before, but I suspect there might be some other issues. So if we go to the randomize button, we can click that, and sure enough, there are more issues to solve. We're not gonna solve them all today, so we're gonna go back to our history view where I've done some more testing before, but if we wanna go back to one that we had, we can copy the CSS out, and we can bring it into our VS Code or you know, an another ticket, and we can copy that in and save it for later. All right, uh, let's go back to the installation directions. To install the package, you need to run npm install CSS chaos add-on dash dash save dev. That enables us to save it to our dev dependencies rather than our bundle dependencies. Next, we need to include our add-on. And this is the same way that you'd include any other add-on. We need to add our namespace to the add-ons array, and that namespace is set to CSS dash chaos dash add-on. Once we have that, we can get up and running. But if we wanted to update the configuration, we do have the options to do so. So we can set the max variance, which allows us to set the number of items that can be randomized by the randomize button. And here on the right, we have it set to five. We also have the ability to show or hide the history. We can change that value from true to false through the properties. And we can also update the property data that can be shown in the add-on view. We can add or remove properties, set the default values, or even introduce dropdown options for a specified property. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope this gave a brief overview of the CSS Chaos add-on and how you can use it to avoid style bleeding issues. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter, Mastodon, or over email by using these links. Have a good one. Hello there, um, my name's Ollie, and I'm here at Storybook Day 2023 to tell you a bit about how we use Storybook at The Guardian. 
um, if you haven't heard of us before, uh, The Guardian is an international news organisation um, publishing in three different countries, the UK, the US and Australia. Um, the website frequently gets over 40 million page views per day and we pride ourselves on delivering a really brilliant web experience to all of our users. Fantastic. So <laughs> I'm going to quickly give you an overview of um, what I plan to cover in the talk today. Um, first off, I'm going to tell you about my team, client side tooling and infrastructure, as well as the general department, product and engineering. Then we'll move on to um, a day in the life of me as a developer and how Storybook and Chromatic helped me as a developer. Um, then we'll look at a more general approach to how I like to structure stories and capture as much as possible in terms of regressions and changes. And then finally, um, four highlights about how we use Storybook in practice, and the, these are four features of the product that we make real use of. So uh, let's get cracking. Righty, so this is a overview slide of the client-side tooling and infrastructure team. Um, we sit within the developer experience stream and we really exist just to help the lives of all the other developers in the department. So we carry out research, we might look into new tooling, um, or even just start discussions around how that could be used or set recommendations for the rest of the department that aren't enforced but um, might be really helpful, say, to a new team setting out to provide a new product to our users. Okay, so moving forwards yet again, um, this is a really brief introduction to the products and engineering department at The Guardian. Uh, in the slide that you're seeing right now, you can see a snapshot of our GitHub organization, and we really take pride in open sourcing as much of our work as possible. Uh, so you can see everything from our open source design system to the front end rendering platform to uh, much, much more if you should choose to visit. Uh, this is also a nice graph of how the department is laid out, um, showing you everything from developer experience, the stream that I sit within, to advertising and supporter revenue who help to provide an income to the paper, over to journalism and journalism tools which help editorial to um, publish news in a really seamless fashion. So to start off with, I thought I'd show you a quick example of a day in the life of me as a developer about a year ago. Um, this is when we were creating the new sign-in and registration front end for The Guardian. And a designer came to me with this set of changes specified in Figma. Um, it clearly shows the gaps between elements and how they vary as the responsive viewport size changes. I'm going to show you how we went from a pull request to reviewing those changes using a tool called Chromatic. If you haven't heard of it, Chromatic is a cloud-based tool which takes your storybook um, project, uh, builds it, and then shows you a preview of these different stories uh, in a format which lets you see the before and after of the uh, change that you've just made compared to the last version that was checked into main. So I made those changes and raised a pull request as you might do normally. And as you can see at the bottom of the uh, slide, there are these two GitHub workflows that have appeared, um, one of which has verified that we've published our storybook successfully to Chromatic. And then the second of those shows that we have conducted all of our UI snapshot comparisons. And two of those have changed and been subsequently accepted as new baselines. So if we take a look at that diff, you can see that Chromatic has provided a really clear um, pixel per pixel diff of each of the changes that I have made. So I think in this change, I shifted around some elements. Um, as you saw earlier, we changed some spacing. Um, and now that we had this available in the cloud, it was a really simple matter for me to go back to our designer and say, hey, I've made those changes. Um, and they were able to comment on them. I think I made some tweaks as a result. Um, but it was a very seamless process going from implementing the change, getting the diff, and iterating based on that feedback. And I think we were able to launch these changes relatively quickly afterwards. So taking a step back and looking at the more general approach of how stories can be created and structured, I find Brad Frost's atomic design methodology to be a really useful guide in my thinking here. 
At the lowest level, you have atoms, and these are the foundational building blocks of your UI. Uh, you can track stuff like the size of, say, a button, uh, the color variant, whether it be a primary button or a secondary button, and you can really introduce some flexibility into how you capture different variants of these components. Moving up a level further, you have something like an expanding wrapper, which could fall under the category of a molecule. Um, these will capture elements which compose several um, of these atoms and could also catch some regressions that could slip into that design, say if you change the styling of one of those buttons. Moving up still further, you have the idea of an organism, which generally are a bit more complicated and compose several molecules, and may even include some business logic. So here you have the left and right buttons. Um, and again, you, we want to catch any regressions that happen within this component on multiple viewport sizes. On the application level, such as on .com rendering, it's very important to keep track of templates and the more generic layouts that may crop up on the website a lot. So we, we um, provide these with data that isn't necessarily production information, but enough to be able to set up a framework to uh, test whether this behaves as expected. And then last but not least, we have pages. Um, and these are usually powered by fixture data sourced from CAPI, our content API. And these are really important as they provide snapshots of our articles in the context in which they will be deployed, which is uh, amazingly useful for when we're regression testing pages as if they were live. So that's been an overview of how I think about creating stories um, when related to the atomic design methodology. Um, I find that it really helps to create the most appropriate stories for the component I'm developing. And that in turn allows us to capture the most relevant snapshots we can to check for regressions. As we move into the last part of this talk, um, I'm now gonna tell you a little bit about how we use Storybook in practice at the organization. Uh, so these are several features of the, of the platform that we make real use of. Uh, so first off, we have the uh, documentation system. So this is all powered by Markdown, as you might be familiar with from uh, platforms like GitHub. And in the example on, on screen, we have our CSS reset, which sits in our source foundations as part of our design system. And we tell people what it is and how to use it. And we do this for a lot of different things that we provide through the design system. So here we have our palette tool, uh, where we both have an example, but also a log of all the different color tokens and the shades of color that sit within them. So our design team can check to see if those correspond to the colors that they expect uh, in their design tools. Moving forward, we have an idea of the composition feature that Storybook provides. So this is brilliant. It allows us to combine external Storybook instances together under one roof. So for example, when we split out our design system Storybooks, uh, we were able to coalesce these underneath a general homepage Storybook, if you will. Um, and as our, uh, as our mono repo grows further uh, to include more libraries and more applications, we can expand this further still by just adding to that composed storybook list. A technique that we use to great effect is the procedural generation of stories. So in the example of pages, we have many different variants of those pages that we want to be able to capture regressions for. Uh, what we do then is we generate all of these different variants and publish these as stories um, so that when we run our chromatic build, we're able to capture any differences that may occur um, based on the changes that you've made as a developer. On top of that, Chromatic have an excellent feature known as TurboSnap, and this detects whether your code changes have actually modified some of the stories that have been tracked via the platform. Um, if the code change will have changed a aspect of that story, uh, Chromatic will rerun and rebuild that story so that you can compare the difference. But if it hasn't, then it will just use the older version that it has already captured, which comes in handy when you have a lot of different stories um, because you can skip a significant portion of, of them um, when you decide to publish your change. 
So that's been a lightning tour of some of the different aspects of Storybook that we use as an organization. Um, there's much more detail that we could go into. Um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch via Twitter. Um, you can see my handle there or via the Discord associated with the Storybook Day um, today. I'll be hanging out on one of the channels there for sure. So once again, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Storybook Day. Bye. Hey, I'm Trisha Leach, a senior developer at Work & Co, where I use Storybook every day to create digital products for clients such as Google, Odyssey, and Steve Jobs Archive. Thanks for joining me today to create a digital garden. Our tech stack will be Storybook 7 with React and Beat. We'll also be using TypeScript, CSS with custom properties for styling, and for animation, frame, or motion. The first thing we'll do is adjust our SVGs. Um, the first thing I do when I export is I remove the width and height. I make sure that we have a view box set. And if there are any fills that have a color, I'm changing them to current color. Viewbox is what will let it flex with the container. And this current color will allow uh, the SVG to inherit the color from the parent. So let's check out our SVG wrapper component and story. Um, here you can see we're taking in props like children, color, width. We're applying those styles inline. If we take a look at the story, um, the args match up to those props, which is what creates the controls here in Storybook. These uh, args are set at the component level, so they'll impact all components or all stories within this component. But we're also setting some, uh, store, uh, some args at the story level. So that's how we're getting these different stories here in the sidebar. Um, one of my favorite ways to work with arg types, uh, especially with children, is by mapping uh, to complex values. Here we're setting options. Um, all of these strings map to these React SVGs, uh, React component SVGs, and we're using a control type of select here in Storybook, and we can change them out with this select. Uh, some of our other controls are color, we can change the width, and we can change our width unit. Now that we have our basic building block of the garden, we will take a look at this uh, ground component. Pretty simple, but it has a Boolean here, has decoration to turn this decoration on and off. We also have a sky component with a circle SVG. And now we'll move on to our composite components. So we're going to be using this floral group component. Um, here, the most important props for this component are quantity and SVG. Uh, we're mapping through that quantity of SVGs to create this repetition here. We also have a number of style uh, props coming in that are again um, attached uh, with style in line. Um, if we take a look at stories, we can see um, one of my favorite controls for working with numeric values is this range type. Uh, over here, you can see with this gap, um, this slider just makes it really easy um, to toggle. Um, here, we will take a look at some of the other controls. Um, we can change the quantity. We'll change this gap. Um, we can also change the color. Um, and then we have some alignment uh, props here. And so these different props are gonna make it really easy for us to fine tune um, our arrangements when we start to put our garden together. Um, this is a process that I would work through every day um, while I'm developing. Uh, I really like to toggle these controls and kind of see where my components might break. Um, here you can see as I scale up this gap, the SVGs are disappearing. So this would be an opportunity for me to fix this bug before it even gets to QA. Now that we have uh, our first composite component, we're going to check out the overlapping groups. And this is where some of the magic with, with color is really going to start to come into play. Uh, so we'll open up this component. 
And here's a story. And uh, admittedly, the magic is not quite happening yet, but I promise we will get there. Um, Storybook comes with this setting where you can change the background. Um, but sometimes you might want to uh, change all of your colors with theming. Um, Storybook allows us to add our own uh, items to the toolbar here. And so this is what I've done with theme. In the preview Storybook file under global types, I've added a theme. Um, and here we've got three items. We've got none, day, and night. So these are the themes I'm working with, and that matches up to what we're seeing um, here. Uh, so changing it, we get a nice grayscale, uh, but an even nicer change is our day, uh, our day theme. And how this is working is I'm adding a global decorator. So this is code that's surrounding all of our stories. So with context, I can grab that theme item I created from context globals. Um, and then that allows me to use this background color um, to grab the color that I need. And then when that theme changes, it's automatically going to change this background color. It's also going to, the decorator is also adding a div around all of the stories with a class name of theme dash, and that will either be day or night. And now we'll open up theme CSS to see how um, all of the colors are working together. So at the root, we've declared all of these um, colors with custom CSS custom properties. And here you can see those different classes that I have. Um, so all of them have a color primary, color secondary, and color tertiary, and so on. Um, and so here, when we're using this day theme, we can see this primary color citron, which is this color right here. Uh, but if we change this to night theme, uh, it's going to change it to cyan. Uh, let's take a closer look at the React component. Um, so one of the props for this component is groups. And this is an array of the floral groups that we looked at earlier. So we're mapping through those floral groups. And essentially, this component uh, overlays them on top of each other with absolute positioning. Um, and then we will look at the story. Uh, so here's that group, uh, our args for groups. Here we can see we already have three floral groups. Uh, but if I start to uncomment uh, these additional floral groups, we'll see more uh, flowers pop up. And here, just like we were able to control um, different aspects of that group with um, the story, we can change uh, those attributes as well. Um, so now we really have a lot of control over these comp um, components and can make a really exciting story um, for our garden. Um, the last co uh, component we'll look at is this garden page. And we'll pull this open. Uh, this is very similar. The story here is very similar to the last component. Um, we're taking a lot of floral groups here uh, to create a more complex garden. Um, so here, let's expand this and we'll take a look at our garden. Uh, so here you can see we're starting with that gray theme. Um, if we change it to day, uh, we'll get those that nice color theme. And let's change it to night. And um, usually when I get to composing pages in Storybook, the content is coming in through a prop. So that's what's happening here with these groups. Um, but these toggles here will, will turn on and off uh, attributes on the page. Um, so here we're going to add a ground and we will add the sky. And um, all of these animations are happening with Framer Motion. Um, I've also added this mixed blend mode. Um, Storybook is kind of a fun place to play around with um, CSS properties that you don't get a chance to, to work with very often. So had some fun adding that. Um, now we're going to go back to the story. Um, I have some more complex animations. I'm going to set all of these booleans to true. Um, so we're really going to be able to see everything coming together. And here you can see when we pop back to this that all of those flower groups um, are popping back in staggered. Um, and the way that this happened with Framer Motion, we can go back to this overlapping groups component 
Uh, this is a very quick intro to frame our motion, but essentially these motion divs. We've got two. This is the container, and these are all the floral groups underneath. Um, and these variants are changing based on uh, it, the is growth staggered prop. Uh, so this is the variant for the container. Um, just adding the staggered children will make any child um, underneath that parent component uh, perform a, a staggered transition or animation. Um, and here, this is the variant item. Um, so it's hiding and showing based on this Y attribute. So that's how, how they're popping up and down. Um, so I hope you've had a really good time taking a look at this project and have gotten inspiration for how you might use Storybook in your own personal projects. Appreciate you spending time with me today, and I hope you enjoy all of the rest of the talks. Today has been so much fun for us. And the reason for that is you, the Storybook community. You are what makes Storybook great. Now, I know that sometimes it can be really difficult to care deeply about making high quality user interfaces in an industry that moves at a breakneck pace. If you're looking for a user focused community of developers and designers, you should join the Storybook Discord. There you'll find 17,000 developers and designers who are developing their skills together, learning the latest trends and techniques, and just honestly, sometimes commiserating about how difficult this field can be sometimes. Now, if you're not ready to take that step and join community, go to storybook.js.org and you'll find plenty of ways to keep up to date with what's happening in Storybook and our industry. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on social, or subscribe to the newsletter. Now, you can direct the future of Storybook in just five minutes by taking the 2023 Storybook survey. There's a link on screen right now with a QR code that will take you right to that survey. Your feedback is invaluable and will really shape the way that Storybook 7 plays out over the next year. Finally, thank you to our wonderful speakers for making today possible. And to you, the Storybook community, for showing up in such an amazing way. We're honored to be part of your day today. That's all for Storybook Day 2023, but we can't wait to see how you use Storybook 7 to improve the UX of the internet. I'm Chantastic. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.